<laughs> you think I might be good at that? I think I think you, you got think it down. A, I think it's I think, a bad idea. I think you nailed it, Gary. I think you have a new career think, ahead of you. I don't think so. I don't have enough left in me. <laughs> this is how you learn, right? This is how you grow. Yeah, it's too much. Yeah. Too much to learn. <laughs> anyway, All right. so welcome to our first uh, video podcast. And uh, some people call it a vlog. I'm not sure what to call it, but anyway, uh, it's titled uh, "The Middle for Men." And you can just call it uh, the middle. Uh, my name is Gary Eelman. And I'm John Berardino. And uh, we're going to be exploring a lot of subjects. Uh, today's uh, episode in particular is called uh, Seeking Permission, I think it is. Seeking Permission. Yeah, we don't know what we're talking yeah. about. We're just starting. So <laughs> you'll have to give us a little bit of break there. Um, seeking Permission is, is about uh, men and, um, and their propensity to seek permission in relationships from women. Um, yeah. You want to start by giving us some background on that, John? Yeah. I think, you know, it's interesting because we were, when we started talking about this, we we're looking at it from the realm of our own personal experiences. And we we're saying, yeah, I noticed this with our friends as well. I noticed this with my colleagues. And we started to ask the question together and saying, yeah, I wonder why men tend to seek permission from their wives or their partners. And why does it appear to be so ubiquitous in our society, regardless of um, your socioeconomic status, your culture, wherever that might be you come from. So we said, well, let's start to think about this a little bit. Let's right. start to consider like, do you have these personal experiences in your life at a particular time? Do I have these experiences? Said, yes, we do. We felt it. We've seen it. We've heard it ourselves. So I think we started to discuss it in the, in the realm of like, why? Why does it occur? Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. Now, now maybe like you, you call it a hypothesis, like let's start to kind of bend our attention deeper into it. But, um, but yeah, I, so I look at it from a clinical lens just because I'm a psychologist and I like to understand why. And uh, as we started to talk about it, I started to consider some of the, the developmental issues that occur early on in, in a child's life. Uh, there's uh, various approaches and theories around it and family systems and uh, psychodynamic theories that kind of involve the ways in which uh, a boy relates to his family, his parents, the people around him, how that shapes his identity and whatnot. But one of the things that I was considering was the relationships that boys have with their teachers. And most teachers, I think around 90%, are actually women early on, especially during the elementary school days. So you have women who are controlling and dictating uh, and regulating the, the, the mind and the behavior of boys. Hmm. And what ends up happening is when uh, a boy will hear something and might be, be quiet, sit down, you know, that type of uh, conditioning influences not just the child's behavior, but also belief systems. And then overall can shape uh, his orientation to the world around him and his identity. So um, <clears throat> what, uh, what we have in, the, in our society today, and it has been prevalent over the last maybe 10, 20 years, is ADHD has become really, really prominent. Oh, yeah. yeah. And uh, it, they've noted that 13% of boys are more likely to be diagnosed as opposed to 6% of girls. And you're saying, you're saying well, that's because <laughs> men, boys have a lot of testosterone. They, they, they express their energy, their physicality through action. Mm. And, um, and so, of course, then the female teacher comes in and tries to regulate that and try to contain it. And sometimes it's actually diagnosed as a psychopathology. So these messages, these experiences get passed down. And these are the formative years in which the, the boy's brain is developing and the, and the ways in which, of course, it affects his identity and assumptions about the world and the ways in which he relates to other people. So this unconscious inner narrative goes on and then it extends into you know, your young adult and young adult, adult life and the adult. relationships that you have. And then, of course, uh, your family and marital life. So I thought it was really, I thought it was really interesting from my standpoint, because if you can imagine when it comes to verbalizing yourself, a boy's going to be, especially early on, less capable than a girl, primarily because a lot of the energy is directed towards action, physicality, the expression of that through sports or other endeavors where his body is being used. And then you have an environment like in school where they're constantly trying to shape and to contain that energy. Hmm. and sit down you know in the boy's mind it might be sit down and shut up <laughs> you know yeah. what i mean and then that is going to and could create to a, a scenario where a boy then shuts down emotionally shuts down in terms of using his words to express himself because yeah. a lot of the times when those words might come out as a boy it might come out in maybe inappropriate ways 
I so I thought it was really interesting because as we're talking about this, like, where would that begin? Yeah. Why would you? Yeah, because we noted it, and you yeah. you even noted this in some of the stories that you have. Yeah. Sure. And saying it's like, why well, was a it's like a like this man is asking his wife for permission to go somewhere. Yeah. Uh, you know, I had never thought about what you just said yeah. about high. And I was as you were talking yeah. about the the school setting, I was thinking back in high school, like girls really never got in trouble. It was always boys, right? Right. I mean, is it true? Right. <laughs> so, Absolutely. Uh, so yeah, it's true. I guess that's testosterone, and not, and and maybe many other dynamics. I don't know, and I don't have any real data for that. I just have anecdotally my own experience in school, but I could tell you for sure it was always the boys that were getting in all my good friends were getting punished i mean yeah. that's the other side i mean and, and and a lot of it had to do with and i didn't know this at the time but i look back and i said oh yeah his they just got a divorce in their family or the dad just left or oh, yeah. there's some type of trauma going on and they're acting out and they're yeah. and then they're acting out yeah. and i and some of my good friends i felt terrible for them when i saw this happening sure. but you, you made a good point i i never saw girls get disciplined no. And managed and regulated, and you know, in in that way in which I saw these boys. So I do think it could be a feature. Yeah, I'm not saying that's the cause. No, I get yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's it's there's something connected there. I don't know what it is, but uh, and and in our school, of course, in, in and you're seeing it from a clinical psychologist's yeah. point of view. I'm seeing it from 70 years of just life, and you know, I got in trouble in school a lot. And in our school at that time, uh, they were allowed to be physical with you, so I got paddled a lot of times. Did like, you really? Oh yeah, oh my yeah. God. Taken out into the hallway, and the uh, teachers could create their own. Just as a little aside, the teachers could create their design their own paddles, and some of them would design them with holes in them so there was less wind resistance. <laughs> oh yeah, it was rough. <laughs> Yeah, we got in a lot of trouble. That is terrible. Yeah, and and you know, I came from a I came from a, a divorced family as yeah. well, and maybe some of that was acting out. I don't know, but but fast forward, yeah, later in my life, uh, I find myself asking permission to do things from you know my my wife. So I've been married four times, and I'm not saying that's a great score, but uh, out of the billions of people in the world, to think that you're going to be with one person forever yeah. and that's your one and only is it's kind of ludicrous, really, but it, it took me that long to not only get myself balanced, but uh, to be in a balanced relationship where my wife doesn't seek my permission for anything, and uh, and I don't seek hers. And that's not to say that if we're buying a house together, we're going to move or something like that. Of course, that's a that's a joint decision. But going back to my earlier marriages, and, and you and I have talked about this before. Uh, I used to hang around at the airport a lot because I flew and, um, you know, I would have guys come up to me, uh, friends and, and, and just people around the airport and say, God, I would love to fly. It's, you know, been my life dream. And yeah. I would say, well, why don't you fly? You know, you go in there and pay an instructor. I'm an instructor. I'll teach you to fly. Yeah. And, um, they would say, oh, my wife would never let me fly. And, I, and I'd say, let you fly. <laughs> How, how old are you? Yeah. And that was after I had had what yeah. I would call an awakening. Yeah. Right? So I was divorced. I was doing my own research into what, what, what it was in my relationship, really, that fundamentally yeah. just didn't work. And that was it. It was, it was the control or the feeling of control yeah. that um, you know, I, I, had a, I had a problem with trying to uh, correct this uh, dynamic where I, I felt like I had to ask permission. I mean, I, ultimately... You know the the marriage just blew up because I wouldn't ask permission about anything anymore. And then and then I have to tell you that after I uh, got out of that marriage, um, I went the other way and I swung hard. I'm, I swung to the point that I was an asshole from time to time. You know, <laughs> uh, my when when Donna and I first got married, we've been married uh, for sixteen years now. When we got first got married, we were going out someplace and. Um, I put on some clothes, and, and she looked at me and said, is that what you're wearing? And I, I, I flipped out on her. I was like, why? Is this not good enough for you? What do you want me to wear? Is, are right. you trying to tell me what I should wear? Right, 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 right. And really, you know, ultimately, I, I came to recognize that I had just become oversensitized and overreacted as a result and became an asshole. And, and what she was trying to say was, there's something more flattering that you could wear the same as I would say to her and she wouldn't take it. Absolutely. And I, and I think that's just it is there is a sensitivity I think built into all men yeah. to some extent, whether, whether you want to admit it or not, it's present and yeah. it's primarily because you have a mother yeah. 
and, the, and she's always your mother. Yeah. And there is a dynamic there in which there will always be kind of an underlying sense of, uh, of insecurity. Of course, love is there, but times when we have experiences with our parents where perhaps we feel, we feel hatred towards them. But that, that kind of binary experience of extremes shows up in our relationships as well. Yeah. You know, like you said, we underreact or we overreact. Right. We submit or we protest. Uh, you know, we say, well, you got to pick your battles, man. Uh, or you say, you're not the boss of me. Yeah. You know, so yeah. you have these types of scenarios and we're discussing it because we're saying, okay, these elements exist within the relationship and you've experienced it in marriages. Mm -hmm. But then we're also saying, okay, well, how did you figure it out, Gary? You know, I mean, you, you have these life lessons. Yeah. And most people don't look at those lessons and change. And, and I wish I could tell you that I had a, you know, a, an epiphany. Right. I, I didn't. It just, but it did happen over a relatively short period of time. I remember I bought a new car <clears throat> and the, uh, the kids were with me in the car and we're riding along and they said, Dad, when I picked them up, they said, Dad, you, you bought a new car. And I said, yeah, I did. And they said, does mom know? And I looked him straight in the eye and I said, I said, Daddy's an adult and he can buy a damn car if he wants to. I yeah. don't I don't need mommy's permission. Yeah. So, you know, is that kind of thing. And it was a buildup of those. And, yeah. and I think, like I said, some interpersonal, uh, I should say, intrapersonal, uh, you know, investigation into what it was that I was feeling and and reading some books about relationships uh, between men and women and, and why they why they tend to go awry so often. Well, I think it's interesting because from a psychological standpoint, we have what's called the shadow. And it's a term that comes from the psychodynamic tradition, Carl Jung. And it basically means that there's this unconscious part of us that we have repressed. And mm -hmm. usually it's whatever elements within our experience or personality that we find to be kind of reprehensible. Mm -hmm. And when we, when we have those movements going from underreacting to overreacting, there can be a tendency for us to experience what we might have done when we were younger, like in, in, in school, where we act out, but we also act in. Yeah. And so you, you, when you say, okay, I'll be obedient, but sure. then you want to act out, and it's unconscious. So this stuff comes up. We're talking about it so that we can start to become more conscious of what those underlying dynamics are as you discuss like okay well what's going on inside of me right. why do i feel the way that i do how does it relate to my past right you know, yeah how does exactly. it relate to my relationship with my mom how does exactly. it you know those types of things but they also said would we want our wives coming to us and asking yeah. for permission and i never did i, I never did I, <clears> it was not it's not something i always told my wife look i didn't and you know this was toward the end of the relationship but at, at that time with with that wife was I, I don't understand i you know i never talked to you about what you want to do you could do anything you want whatever you want to do you want to go buy a new car go buy a new car i don't care yeah we can afford it yeah now if it's something we can't afford uh that's going to take some discussion if we only have one car in the family that's going to take some discussion and and i think the point a good point to probably bring up here is we're talking about the term permission yeah right yeah that, I mean, is this permittable as opposed to, like you mentioned, there's moments where you're going to obviously communicate, reference, reveal, whatever that might be about what you're doing or how, you know, but when, when we descend to a place where we're asking for permission, then that, that there's a movement in terms of the ways in which we relate and, and that becomes problematic. Essentially, we want, you know, kind of an equal type experience so that there's parity between the ways our, our perspectives and how we engage and interact with each other. But seeking permission or anticipating some type of negative response is going to shape then a man's behavior. Sure. And I could be emasculating. It, it could be something that affects overall. I mean, because there might be feelings of anger that get repressed. Mm -hmm. Did you feel anger when you had to? Oh, yeah. Have, okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah. There were times I remember feeling enraged by, you know, the idea that yeah. she would disagree with me. And, and I, I, I guess I ultimately became angry at myself for yeah. la allowing myself to get into a position right. where I would have to ask anybody uh, right. what I want, you know, permission for what I wanted to do in my right. life. So, so seeking permission for me was, uh, after a while, was, was just the worst possible thing. 
And and I think that's another part because we don't talk about the un, whatever the underpinnings of that. Okay, you know, I get upset with myself because I'm in a situation like this. Why can't I get myself out mm-hmm. of it or make it better? Yeah. And then we go into a shame cycle. Yeah, exactly. And then we start to think negatively of ourselves and self doubt and things like this. And then we get into a whole host of other coping behaviors that could be bad or maybe depressive symptoms or yeah. anxiety and things like yeah. that as well. Yeah. Ironically, uh, in the industry that I was in, I was a, a, a relatively successful and and got to be a fairly high level executive and i was a leader and um i was a completely different personality than, yeah. I, than I was at home and then i go home and you know that's uh, i was i was a uh, you know i was powerless basically and and became overshadowed by the person that i was with and ultimately that that just blew up and i mean you know it, it blew up hard it was bad and, and understandably, so I mean, again, like all this stuff's going on inside of you when you come home, like there's stuff inside of you, there's stuff outside of you and knowing how to manage that is difficult. Yeah. And it goes back to my point earlier in, in the environment in elementary school where you're, you're, you're constantly exposed to situations where you have some type of a female figure who's regulating your behavior. That's in school. But what, what about the family dynamics, John? I mean, what do you, what do you think about that? I, I lived with a, an imbecile for a stepfather and, and another one for a mother. But my mother was, uh, you know, the matriarch of the family. And, um, you know, my, my stepfather was just the, you know, pummeler. If we did something wrong, we got, you know, he, 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 beat, he beat us and things like that. But, but my mother pretty much set the rules. And uh, even for him, even for him, she set the rules, even though he was violent with her um, from time to time. Well, yeah, and that's a good point, because what we have here in the family dynamic is there's an interdependence, there's relationships, there's roles, there's hierarchies. Some of those are implied, some of those are maybe more direct and, and, and spoken, and verbalized. But when we're not aware of the dynamic we're also not aware of the role that we play within that dynamic. Right. Yeah. So we kind of assume roles. Yeah. Sometimes there's a, a persecutor. Sometimes there's a rescuer and sometimes there's a victim or kind of a blend of others that are involved with it. If there's many siblings or whatnot, but um, there's something called the drama triangle um, and a theorist Cartman who talks about this, that references how these roles are you know kind of remain in a position where you have them in your childhood and then they're played out later on in your other relationships as an adult so you have somebody says well it's your fault or you have somebody says well okay i'm going to be there to help you and save you and rescue you the white knight syndrome is common in, in, in a lot of men oh my god funny you would mention that yeah. <laughs> i mean uh that that was actually my first marriage uh was was definitely white knight syndrome i mean right. she was being um, you know, unfortunately, um, very badly, tre- I'll just say very badly treated to protect anybody who might know me and, and mm-hmm. know her. But um, I, I definitely, I definitely, uh, you know, needed to save her. And um, so a, a lot of my friends at that age, they were getting married young because, uh, you know, the That's girl would end up pregnant. Yeah. And it was just common in a lower, yeah. lower middle class neighborhood. Mm-hmm. But uh, I was uh, 19 and she was 16 uh, when we got married. Wow. And that's, and, yeah, I know. It's, uh, it's just kids. <laughs> you have no moly. idea what you're doing. And oh, of my course, God. And of course, you know, the end result of that was a, a, a tragedy. But yeah. um, because, you know, we had a kid uh, finally uh, after, after a year and a half or so. And uh, my daughter, and, and she got slammed in that, uh, like kids do in divorces. But, I mean, clearly, uh, what I what I was trying to do was save her from that household, and and what I didn't know was that the level of suffering that she had, uh, there was nothing I could do about it. Like, why men think that they're qualified? Like, the, like you know, you're a clinical psychologist, yeah. you can actually help somebody. Yeah, right. I I had no qualifications at all. In fact, I was probably half as screwed up as she was, but or maybe more so. But clearly, I, there was nothing I could do for it. Well, and that's just it, is, is what you might have felt early on in your childhood experience in that environment then gets replicated later on. And we don't know. That's the, the problem, is there's these invisible parts of us that continue to keep being played out. We'll project them yeah. out into the world, often through a fantasy of some kind that says, this woman or this person it happens to be victimized or happens to, 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 to need help or support or guidance or whatever that might be. I can do that. I assume it. And then, of course, there's going to be unconscious dynamics that 
don't just create this streamlined experience that she'll push back or I might not get my needs met. What about me? I'm giving, giving, giving. Is there anything in return? So there's going to be conflict that comes from that. If you don't understand those unconscious dynamics, there's the likelihood that those projections persist. And then from those projections, you're just living out this interpersonal drama. Yeah. And, and that's where these crises occur and things like this. Kind yeah. of like the one we we're talking about. Yeah. And, yeah. and I, I think that uh, people, women who have come from, uh, unfortunately, girls who <clears throat> then, you know, at, at the girl stage have been um, abused to the point that their, their self-esteem has just been crushed. I mean, mm -hmm. they're not going to be in a healthy relationship. It's the same with guys, too. But I'm saying, you know, the guy has the white knight syndrome of, of needing to save that right. person because you don't see that. You know, it's not obvious to you that, that she's suffering with uh, horribly low self-esteem. And that, I mean, that's, you know, all we see is the suffering and uh, exterior-wise, right? And we know intellectually what's happening and we want to correct that. But the deeper things that you guys deal with yeah. uh, in your profession, I mean, that's not something that the ordinary man is qualified to deal with. There, well, yeah, I would say just the ordinary person, just in general. Ordinary I mean, inside person, it, we, yeah. we never get, we don't have access to this information. Right, right, you know, there's right. not, there's not yeah. a school in between math and yeah. history that says, hey, why don't you, uh, why don't we start to talk about your um, um, regulating your emotional states and distress tolerance yeah. and, and dealing with the psychodynamics of, uh, of, of your family experience? You know, I mean, these these uh, un unfortunate um, neglects or uh, negations, I should say, um, really, I think, have a lasting impact on us when it comes to these type of marital scenarios that we're talking about and seeking permission. I will say this. We do live in a passive aggressive culture hmm. and the tendency is to avoid overt conflict. Yeah. So when we're, when we're looking at seeking permission, we're saying this is a way for me to escape conflict. Right. So submission uh, in asking permission of some kind, you know, it, it actually, there's a you know, cost benefit analysis here. Yeah. You know, got to choose sure. your battles, man. You got to pick your battles. Is this the hill you want to die on? Is this really? you you know? Right. And I think we're saying, you know, what, uh, going to get the, the Buffalo wings with you or whatever yeah. we talked about with that story yeah. or the wrath of my wife when I come home afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I, like I said, uh, Donna and I ended up, my, my wife, um, and ended up now, um, you know, quite balanced in that regard, but, but there's been, there's been, you know, there's been that initial, uh, reaction, overreaction on my part, really to, to her making comments, even the slightest thing. Um, one night, I, I think this is kind of comical. Uh, I had been drinking and, uh, I don't drink a lot. Okay. But uh, no judging. Um, but I like wine and, and I had had a few glasses of wine with a friend of mine and, uh, his wife and my wife were in the kitchen talking and, and um, uh, well, you, you know, Eric, he's yeah, yeah. a friend of yours. Yeah. And, and anyway, uh, they were in the kitchen talking and my wife came in to me cause he, he and I were singing to some rock and roll songs. I don't remember what it was. And she, uh, she told me that we needed to turn the stereo down, you know, that they were trying to talk. And I, I, because of the alcohol, which removes your inhibitions yes. and, and, and lets you think you do want to die on that hill, right? Uh, I said, uh, well, why don't you move to another room? You just don't want us to have a good time and blah, blah, blah. So right, I, after, right. after company left, she was pretty angry. And she said, you know, I, don't, I didn't like the way you spoke to me. And we were just trying to have a conversation. You could have been considerate. And once again, because I had been drinking, I overreacted and I, I overreacted and uh, said something pretty nasty to her. And she said, well, I think I'll just sleep in the other room tonight, which she had never said to me. And uh, I, I said, I don't give a shit where you sleep. That's literally what I said. You could sleep out on the lawn for all I care. Oh well, <laughs> so she left yeah. and went upstairs. And uh, I started to slowly sober up, and I started washing the dishes. And then I remembered what I had just said to her. And I went, uh-oh. Uh <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> so I went upstairs and I said, uh, I don't want you to sleep on the lawn. Yeah. I don't want you to sleep in the other room. Yeah. And I yeah. was an asshole and yeah. I'm sorry. Well, and that, and that brings us to a good point because it, it goes back to the protest versus the submission. Yeah. You know, and were you underreacted, you know, cause there might've been a moment, honey, can I, can I, can I sing in the kitchen? Are you okay <laughs> yeah, with that? Yeah, you know, yeah. you know, you're not going to do that. Yeah. Right. But you're, you're in those moments, like you said, there's going to be a part of you that, that feels that that emotion come up mm. and then it's going to be through an outburst. And what I've noticed is what we call anger management problems are actually symptoms of repressed anger. Mm. 
hmm. not knowing how to distill the anger to promote healthy communication. Yeah, and that's really what it's all about, right? Hel healthy communication. I mean, a dialogue is what you really seek in a healthy relationship. Yes, we want to move towards the middle. Yeah. We want to move towards the middle. The name of our podcast. The name of our podcast, exactly. The midtime of life, that's yeah. a good time for you yeah. to, to learn how to create compromise. But what it's going to take is knowing yourself, yeah. knowing your history, your yeah. personal life history, yeah. knowing the ways in which that's influenced beliefs, behaviors, assumptions, um, ideas about yourself, identity, self-worth, all those things. But then also learning conflict resolution. Well, so, so great point. Yeah. Learning conflict revol uh, uh, resolution. I almost said revolution. See, that was my overreaction. Right okay. now. Like, yeah, I'm going to have a revolution. Um, learning conflict resolution is not something that happens in school, really. I mean, it's not taught. It's not taught in college. No. And so you end up jumping into life, into a marriage, which you, you couldn't possibly get a more tight relationship in terms of space and individuality and things like that is suddenly you're, you're combined together. And if you haven't had that kind of experience or training or, or been educated in how to resolve conflict peaceably and in a balanced way and intellectually and not overreacting, all those things you were talking about. Yeah. Um, I guess the question is, well, the comment is that it seems to me that we waste an awful lot of our life our lives uh, uh, not knowing those things. I mean, life is is in, is is finite. I almost said infinite. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know, here I am at seventy years old. I'm still learning. I, I think we learn all of our lives, but this Absolutely. is an important lesson to learn very early on because now you're going to spend who knows the next twenty, thirty years with a person, and you better learn how to get along because it can be hell. And uh, it, it, I'm, I, I can attest to that. It can, and that's you know, I mean, the first marriage you're referencing, Gary, that's basic training for you. I mean, yeah. there's all of that is you learning learning, 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 but in some respects, you know, just being triggered because your needs aren't being met. And what, what I notice is important to do is to have an avenue where you can consider, okay, what am I feeling? That's a question. Yeah. And then you, as you consider those emotions, then you also say, well, what do I need? Now, yeah. What do I need from this experience that I'm having or the person that I'm with? Let's say it's my wife. And then after I reveal those things and do my best to do that conscientiously to say, well, these will be the consequences that there's some repercussion if I feel that you're not acknowledging my words. Okay, so there's, there's responsibility there. Yeah, it, it would. I hear what you're saying. And, yeah. and I'm, what I'm thinking is that it would be good for someone like you mm -hmm. that has that kind of um, perspective mm -hmm. on relationships and on this whole uh, dynamic of mm -hmm. seeking um, permission mm -hmm. to s sit down and, 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 and this is utopia, right? It's not going to happen. But I mean, it would just seem to me that uh, a couple planning to get married to sit down with someone like you that could talk through those kind of yeah. things before yeah. they make this, you know, forever commitment to, yeah. to one another. And, and ask them, you know, ask them real life questions like, um, uh, so what are you going to do if uh, John comes home and wants to buy a new Mercedes? You know, yeah. is that something that you're going to be okay with? Or do you, do you expect for him to, you know, just go through these type of things so that they understand at least where they are? Because I think a lot of couples don't even find out where they are until they're already in that situation. And now suddenly, I know for me. Uh, it started to build up resentment over time, yeah. over years. Yeah. It was it was just building up resentment. Yeah, and and I what what I notice is that people have walls up. So you have to imagine you, you, when you get married, you're projecting all these fantasies out onto the other person. This person's yeah. gonna do this for me, or or perhaps uh, give to me in the way that I wasn't given to when I was younger. So mm -hmm. these unconscious assumptions are then projected out onto the other person without the other person knowing that these fantasies exist. Yeah. Mom didn't give to me in this way, but maybe, maybe Kate will, you know, um, what, what, uh, what was done to me that was so bad, maybe won't be done to me, uh, in the relationship. When we realize though, that that person is not going to resolve that right. a wall comes up, defensiveness is created. And what I notice in my practice is that people come in with a lot of walls hmm. that are actually worse than the wounds themselves. So I have to work on, you know, finding value to, to courageously and compassionately finding ways to bring those walls down and then to bring out the, the words, the language to be able to describe that. 
Yeah. And that challenge. So with, with, with men, we tend to, to struggle with a term called alexithymia, which is, I don't have, God bless you. I, I, know, right? <laughs> I don't have words for my feelings. I don't have words to communicate what I'm feeling. Yeah. So it's acted out. Yeah. And that's what you see with I mean, a lot of children, but most notably with boys. Yeah. And that's where that comes from in that they, then they, they go inward and then they shut down and they withdraw and they hide. Yeah. Yeah. And they'll hide in many different things, you know, um, to cope with their pain. But I, I do think really what it gets to is finding a way to learn how to courageously communicate with the people around you is most notably your wife here to take ownership of your inner conflict where you're struggling with that stuff. And then of course, with your outer conflict, it's amazing to mm-hmm. me. And, and what you're saying is yeah. uh, right on the money that, uh, you said develop the, uh, enough courage basically to yeah. be, to be able to confront, uh, uh, this conflict. Yes. Right. Yeah. And it's amazing to me that growing up as boys, um, we have all this testosterone, as you mentioned, yeah. you know, I got, I don't know if you did, but, um, my high school was rough. And so I got in fights and you, you had to develop some courage and yeah. you, you had to be able to deal with conflict mm-hmm. or you're going to get your ass kicked. Right. Um, and I'm not going to say I haven't gotten my ass kicked, <laughs> but I fought yeah. uh, when I needed to. Fought back, yeah. And, and, and if you didn't, uh, well, you were a sucker. And, and by the way, the loser got dragged down in the hallway and got that paddle I was talking okay. about. That happened to me once. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but moving forward in, mm-hmm. into the future, how that affects you when you grow up is that you had the courage to do things that you maybe even didn't think you had, and yeah. you found that, and yet you're in a relationship. And it, it strikes me that you have to work at developing that much courage to develop to uh, confront that kind of a conflict. It seems to me like it should be a no-brainer. And yet, looking back, I was guilty of not having that courage to uh, to confront that kind of conflict until it was too late, until it was all over. Yeah, I, and I think again, but it's not discussed, Gary. You didn't know. You know, I mean, you wouldn't have known. No one, you don't have a figure in your life saying, what if we found ways, healthy, uh, compassionate ways to look inside yourself to see where that suffering is and then to articulate sure. that to sure. the other person around. That takes vulnerability. Yeah. That takes dedication. That takes sacrifice and things like that. But again, we're, we we tend to just kind of react to what goes on within our environment sure. and then react to go, what goes on inside of us. We hide. Uh, we hurt. And then that's when someone comes into me with to me and then we face and we confront that we hold on to that information. We listen to it and examine it and then we let it go. Yeah. So along those same lines, um, very few men really, if you, if you took the broad, um, uh, uh, and I'm talking about in our society, Mm -hmm. I don't know about the rest of the world, but if you took our gender broadly in, in the United States, for example, or North America, maybe, um, we don't generally have the courage to be vulnerable, do we? No. And, and it's because- I mean, what, what percentage of men can actually, I mean, I don't know if you have any data on that. I know. I'm I don't even, I don't, what your, I, I your think, thoughts are. I think the interesting thing would be is if it's studied, you know, I, I don't, it's a, it's a unique variable that we tend to maybe not, you know, kind of acutely give much attention to. Um, and I think it's just, we, we look at the symptoms of our society and then we tend to try to kind of triage that. We don't look deeper as to what we might be going beyond, you know, beneath the surface and to say, okay, well, where is this coming from and why? And like I said, the alexithymia, you deal with these kind of unconscious dynamics from your child. And again, it's not just the interpersonal conflict. It's what's going on inside of you. The shame. Why didn't I do that? I should have done that. Yeah. I could have done this or I should yeah. have like you, like you had that moment with Donna. You're like, sure. God, that was, oh, that was bad. yeah, that was bad. So then it's you funny feel, now for both of us. It's but fun. It yeah. You can look back, but she was hurt. Yeah. You were, yeah. you know, that's not you. No, that's so, not uh, so we say we, we demonstrate these behaviors and then we look back and we're like, Oh my God, why did I do that? Why did I say that? And it's because there's this unconscious stuff inside of us that we don't look at or know about that's living in us without consent. And so, that's what those walls are. So we refer to IQ, right? But, yeah. But then there's sort of the EQ, isn't there? Yeah. And and we don't. I mean, that's not that's not a focus. It really isn't. It's like how high is your IQ? But your emotional quotient could be a, a negative number. And I know a lot a lot of men that are that way. I mean, they just they just have no ability to communicate emotion um, to anyone. Um, some of them are are. I actually feel sorry for them because I feel like. 
well, they can't express love. They're unable to express love to, to their brother, mm -hmm. to their wife, right. to even and in some cases, to the, tragically, to their children. Yeah. And, and also, they're suffering inside. I mean, yes. they're just not able to do that. And then, and then you'll have men that would look at us talking about this and say, hey, you guys are a bunch of whistles talking about love and all that thing. But if, if you don't have love, I mean, you're, you're just an inanimate object. Real, well, you're, an, you're animated, maybe, 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 but you don't feel anything. So you might as well um, be a robot or a microphone or whatever. I agree. And, yeah. and, and, and this, I think, it comes to a good point of empathy, too. You know, we're talking about being able to sense in another person where they're suffering, but to communicate some semblance of love, attention, recognition, the recognition yeah. of another person's suffering is, is highly therapeutic and remedial. But we're also talking about love just in terms of intimacy. And there's many different types of intimacy. Yeah. Um, there's emotional intimacy, intellectual intim intimacy, there's physical intimacy, there's sexual intimacy. There's many different ways in which we engage intimately. Um, but I think when it comes to love, we also want to ask, well, do I love myself? Do I love myself? Mm -hmm. Do I, do I feel integrity within myself? And it's difficult yeah. to answer that question. It's not only difficult, but I think for a lot of men and I, and, I, and I'll start with myself, mm -hmm. it's a, uh, it's, it's an uncomfortable question. It's an uncomfortable question. It I mean, is. Do I love myself? I don't know. You know, uh, I spend time with myself, you know, all day. Um, I talk to other people. I guess yeah. I care about myself. Yeah. I take care of my health. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess I do. But it is a, to ponder that question maybe for the first time, and it's not the first time I have, um, but I can yet still feel the, uh, some discomfort and understand why most men, uh, because their lack of their lack to be uh, vulnerable, yeah. uh, would have uh, discomfort uh, processing that. I, and, and I would say a lot of that goes back to the self-respect that relates to this dynamic that we're, the topic is in, in seeking permission. Do I respect myself enough in order to have that moment of conflict? Right, right. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Wow. So that I can trust myself in that moment to be able to navigate through that. And that's why the words makes, I'm mentioning the alexithymia, I'm mentioning words have consequences, because usually when those words come out at times, whether you're an eight-year-old boy who tells the teacher, screw you, I don't need to listen to you, and, you know, and then you're disciplined and you're paddled outside, or whether it's that moment you had with Donna. Sure. Words have consequences, and yeah. if you're not adept, with understanding the origin of those words and how and why they're being communicated in that moment. Or I would even say the words, I'm sorry, the term, I'm sorry, that's, that's difficult to get to. It's difficult to it's get to. It's difficult to get it's to. It's not for me anymore. I, yeah. I, I'm, I'm pleased with myself about that. I actually am because, you know, acknowledging that, that you've made an error, that you, you're mistaken is, um, uh, so a number of years ago, along his lines, again, another little anecdote is everybody on email is trying to, dominate one another in a large corporation like yeah. i was in and so you find the rating emails on top of emails on top of everybody has to have something to say yeah. and their their thing has to be better and they have to be right yes and it's 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 kind of a ridiculous culture that has happened since um email because nobody had the time to write letters like that yeah. before email and i yeah. span that time right so i watched it all change right. And after a few, uh, you know, a few years of, of dealing with this constant email back and forth and, and the, the competitiveness that I could see and the inability for people to acknowledge that they were wrong. And, and I, I also think that ties into this vulnerability mm -hmm. that we're talking mm -hmm. about, right? You have to be vulnerable to say, I was wrong. I'm sorry. Yes, absolutely. So I started putting on all of my emails at the bottom. If you scroll down past my name. If I if I mm -hmm. even put my name there, but if you scroll down five spaces, and I learned this from somebody that I was reading um, on a, a forum um, who was giving advice, I would write my opinion about whatever it was, and then if you scroll down five lines, you would find I could be completely wrong, yeah. and I'd put that on every email. So just to state it out there, look, this is just my opinion. You know, yeah. I'm not saying this is the way the world is, yeah. but I think that same sort of courage to do that is is what. If, if you uh, move that into a, a relationship situation, I think you have to be able to, you know, look at your wife when you've, you've been an ass and just and say, you know, hey, I was wrong. I was just wrong. Well, and it's, it's the most vulnerable relationship we're going to have. You know, I mean, yeah. that, that dynamic where I'm having another person in my life who loves me, who cares about me, but also criticizes me and complains about me or, or even corrects me. <laughs> <laughs> it's difficult to have those moments. And 
I think if you, if you experience that and you're not able to contend with it inwardly yeah. first, like, okay, what does that mean? I just got corrected. I, yeah. I, I wasn't, uh, you know, doing something correct when we were you know, washing the dishes or whatever. And my wife turns to me and said, no, you can't put the dishes in that way, you know, or something like that. And um, well, how was it communicated? Yeah. You know, was there a sharpness to it? Exactly. How did I respond? How, yeah. Did I shut down? Did I react? Did I misconceive what she did really I meant by that? Did I misconceive what she meant? Did how yeah, did how did great, my reaction affect her? It's a great point. You have to triage those moments. You do. Yeah. You really just do. You have to. You have to get to them quickly, or they build up, and then you get resentment, and then it comes out passive aggressively. I think. I think most men, and at least I've never met a man that wouldn't uh, readily agree that uh, being married to a woman um, and, and women can say the same thing that says I'm, I'm not I'm just uh, I'm just observing here mm-hmm. okay um, I, don't, I don't think I've ever met a man uh, who wouldn't understand uh, if I said to him well my wife's you know you know she's getting on my nerves because of this or that yeah and, and uh, you know that she tends to tell me uh, criticize what I do yeah. and uh, that sort of thing and, and yet uh, it is the most most vulnerable relationship mm-hmm. that we're going to have, and we have to treat that carefully. I, and and a, a perfect example uh, last night, I, I had had a, a pretty rough day yesterday. Some things I was dealing with, and I had to go out. They, they didn't drop off the mail or anything. And and I have I have a heart condition. It's not a bad one, but I have a I have a atrial fibrillation and a couple other issues. But it was down to I don't know 15 degrees or something. And I said I said damn I for, I forgot to go get the mail. And, and my wife turned to me and said, let me get that for you. And, and you know, these yeah. moments of love, just you've got to con- consider those and the yeah. balance of things. And, yeah. and I, I thought about it for, you know, a couple of minutes after. It's like, it like, wow, she was just, she wasn't, she wasn't dressed. She was going to get her shoes on and her coat on and everything. And, yeah. and, you know, it's a fair distance at 15 degrees to walk yeah. to the mailbox. And, yeah. So, yeah, I think. Um, but it means a lot. I mean, means, that's those a, things mean a whole lot. I, and, and it's a good point, Gary, because I don't think we really take a tally of just how important those moments are to take a moment to reflect on, you know, Donna just taking, uh, you know, this really impromptu moment and yeah. then turning it into something that meant a lot to you. Yeah. She might not have even known how much that meant no, to you. No, she didn't. You know, she, she didn't. She didn't. Right. And, and I've had those moments with my wife. It's the same thing where I, where she'll, she'll do something, uh, generously, uh, or, or sacrificially. And I'll like think to myself, like, that felt good. Yeah, that, that, felt, that, felt, that felt really, really good. good yeah. But but we don't have those moments maybe where we turn to our wives and say, hey, you know what, I just want to let you know I appreciated that. Yeah. Um, and because, you know, we do a lot for our wives. I think it's instinctive for us to just, yeah. you know, to be motivated to do those things. Yeah. Um, and I know there are times maybe when they might appreciate us and things like that. But it's good for us to note that when it comes to the responsibility of these interactions, we say, how can I do unto the, uh, you know, do unto yeah, others as yeah, I want done unto exactly. myself. And I think that's what would help creating some type of a resolution yeah. when it comes to these tendencies, like seeking permission, you know, recognizing that we, we want to have some emotional literacy around those moments. We want to be accountable to those moments. Right. We want to be able to say, I'm sorry for those moments, but also to know that if there is going to be conflict, trusting in your ability to be able to use the words to manage that moment so how do we get women to stop nagging us no i'm just kidding well I'm so, just, I'll, I'll, I'll answer i'll answer that. Okay. it's a good question though <laughs> right. it is a very good question yeah stop shutting down and hiding yeah you know because shutting down withdrawing exactly. stonewalling it's sort know, of an indication isn't it it is yeah because I, I i mean in as much as i don't like it i also recognize that i'm probably doing something where i'm moving away from it yeah yeah, and that, that's what I'm saying. That's where that shutting down comes from in childhood. Yeah. When the boy shuts down because he doesn't have the words to articulate what he's feeling, he does the same thing with his wife. Yeah. And then he puts he pulls away. The wife notices he's pulling away. How's the wife going to get his attention? Perhaps yeah. nag or, or complain or whatever yeah. that might be. And then you have this conflict, and right. it's never resolved. You're just dealing with the symptoms of it. Yeah, I mean, you know, the funny thing is I will nag Donna from time to time. And I'm not trying to. Yeah. And I don't even realize it. And then she'll go, stop nagging me. Yeah. And, and I think about it. I go, yeah, yeah, she, yeah. she's right. I was nagging her. <laughs> you know? And, uh, okay, now you recognize when you're nagging me. How about that? Okay? Yes. You know, I think that's fair. We want reciprocity. But, yeah. We want responsibility. We want to recognize that each of us need to do our best to take ownership of it, but it also takes some vulnerability when it comes to the hallmark of a great relationship, which is rupture and repair. Wow. That 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 Jesus. that we can have that fight. 
Sounds sounds big. It it is it it is it it, it is big. But you sometimes you just need to have the language there to say I can have this conflict. Sure, and we're gonna come out and we're gonna be all right. We're gonna be okay. And that takes takes courage. Yeah, takes vulnerability. It takes maturity. I mean these these are all elements that I think that's why we're talking about it right now because it feeds into this issue around seeking permission. Well, well, I've told Donna if she ever leaves me, I'm going with her. So. It's just there's no chance at, at my age that anything bad's going to happen in that regard. But um, so uh, I, I wanted to just uh, um, broadcast out to our audience here that um, while this is uh, the first um, vlog or or a podcast, and it may be both, we may end up putting this out as a podcast on on Spotify or some of those uh, uh, some of those venues. Um, the next one that we have coming up. Uh, on, on a vlog yeah. here will be about men's health. And, uh, I think we have, uh, we have some good information on that some real data, uh, to talk about and some good counsel. Uh, John is actually a doctor though, not a medical doctor. And, uh, I'm not a medical doctor, but I've had enough health problems and been interactive enough to know that, uh, uh with my own situation and with other men that I know that, we're just not engaged enough with our own health, and that starts at an early age. There's so much yeah. that you can prevent so that by the time you're – if you think that you're okay at 50 and you haven't focused on your health, you're completely wrong. I can tell you that. And I've got some pretty strong feelings about that, about how men are treated by doctors uh, all the time, and, and um, we just don't get the information that we need. We don't get to participate. And a lot of that has to do – I mean, in some ways, with what John is talking yeah. about is conflict avoidance. Mm-hmm. And um, so that's one of our episodes. Uh, and another one will be on uh, critical thinking, which is, I think, my favorite topic. Mm-hmm. And John and I have had a lot of discussion mm-hmm. about that. And, and there are those that can critically think and those that can't. And I want to know <laughs> why those that can't can't. So we're going to have uh, we're going to go down a rabbit hole. That's on that gonna one, probably. One. It's right? going to be a good one. I think we're going to have a lot to say. And as we're talking about the middle, the mid-time uh, point of life, it's a time not only when you, where we're talking about reflecting on what's going on interpersonally and, and intrapersonally, but we're also talking about what's going on with your physical health and why we need to participate in that. And exactly. when we have an interaction with a figure who's like an authority figure, like a doctor of some kind, who's got an expert, who's a lot of knowledge, do I have the courage to say, you know what, I don't, dis- I don't really agree with you on yeah, that. Yeah. Can I, can I, can I, you know, that's ask a hard more, thing to do. Can I ask more questions? Yeah, you know, you know, yeah. can I ask questions? Can, there you <laughs> go. You're seeking permission. <laughs> I am. I mean, can I ask this question? You am know? I allowed to ask a question? Well, it's true though. Yeah. I mean, think of how many no, people go it. into a doctor yeah, and say, totally. does this sound stupid? I mean, it's kind of like a, a moment like you'd totally. have in school. Like, yeah. does this sound stupid if I raise my hand? Yeah. Same thing when you go into your doctor. And I know yeah. you've experienced that with some of your friends and yourself well, as well. We'll, we'll certainly explore that one. Yeah. Um, so for now, again, the name of the podcast is The Middle for Men. And uh, I'm Gary Ilman. And I'm John Berardino. And uh, we'll see you on the next one. So, um, well, goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs>